Oh. We're on broadcast, Helen. It's it's on, Sally. Sally, it's on. No, no, it's fine. I'm plugged in, so. Yeah. Are they asking that? One person with a hearty appetite and You're promoted, Alex. 
Okay. Tell everybody we're gonna start in a couple minutes. We're just waiting for a few more people to log in and then we'll You've done the slideshow? Okay. Are you gonna talk first, Joe? Okay, cool. I'm ready whenever you are.
Good. Come on over there, yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone. My name is Alex and I'm the community manager at Lots of Pema Works. We're a new co-working of an event space in Barrio Viejo in Tucson, Arizona, for those of you joining out of state. Um, and we're super excited today to put together um, really a neighborhood event um, that's both a fun free event for the community and is also a fundraiser for those here in our community. So together with La Suprema and with the Cornet, which is a really amazing restaurant just across the street from us um, in Five Points Market. We're super excited to put this together. So we have Chef Moody here from the Cornet. Um, um, hello. Hi, thank you. <laughs> and we, we had um, groceries supplied by Five Points Market, which is really cool. We had a lot of people pick up supplies there and a lot of the ingredients here tonight are from there. Um, and then this is all in efforts to support the Lalo Guerrero elderly housing that's here in Barrio Viejo. Um, through the pandemic, you know, a lot of folks um, it's, it's, are putting themselves at risk going out to the grocery store. So we were really excited to be able to provide um, grocery bags and personal hygiene items to the 65 residents there. Um, our original goal was $2,000 um, to supply one week's worth of groceries for all those folks. And we surpassed that goal. We're already past $3,000 and we raised the, we increased the goal to 5,000. So um, if you're able to give and you can do that tonight, um, we are really welcoming donations. There's, you know, there's still time to donate, um, you know, during the class, after the class, um, we're super excited. But without further ado, let's all learn how to cook some good food. Um, super excited to introduce Thank you. Lady Alberati Appreciate um, it. of the Coronet. Thank you so much. How's it going, everybody? It's kind of a, a wild way to do a cooking class, but uh, I, I hear there's a lot of people watching, so hi to all. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here, uh, and it's an honor to raise as much money as we did for um, a, a really wonderful cause. So without further ado, we'll begin the potatoes. So um, everybody's got their bags or their ingredients, or you know, I'm sure that that's all set up. So if anybody has questions, I think you can chime in and talk to me about it. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start our potatoes. So we're gonna start with our little red potatoes. Um, and we're gonna, I keep wanting to say like, has everybody got their potatoes? But I'm sure we do. <laughs> so here we are gonna cut these in half. And since these are gonna kind of take a while, we're gonna start with this. I also uh, set our oven to 350 degrees. That's where we're, all of our roasting is gonna be done. So uh, first step would be to get your oven set and hot so that when we heat things up, we're all kind of heating it up together at the same time. All right, so potatoes into a little saucepan, medium size, good amount of salt, and we're gonna cover those with water. And I'm just going to start to boil these on high heat. So I just put those on high. And in the meantime, we're going to start uh, getting our vegetables ready to roast. So uh, Jasper over at Five Points pulled some really beautiful produce for us. And uh, I see that the radishes have tops. So uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to cut the radishes off. And then we're going to save the tops to make a little salad later. So I'm just going to cut the radishes and cut them right in half. And uh, I'm putting those into a mixing bowl and reserving our radish tops for a little bit of salad later. And I hope everybody has a glass of wine. Uh, I'm sure you do. Even though I can't see you, I feel like there's some wine flowing. <laughs> so, I'm just gonna cut these in half. Try to move quickly. All right. And then once we have the radishes cut, I'm just gonna lightly dress them with uh, salt and pepper and a little bit of oil. 
You're just moving these items, Jeff, because people want to Thank you. To see Perfect. Of course. Board. Got it. Cutting board on display. Sometimes I feel like there's a camera above me, but there's You're there's really not. Yeah, exactly. All right. <laughs> One day when we're really fancy like that. So it's a little bit of oil. This is the oil mixture that was in the bags from Five Points. And I just toss the radishes and oil and then a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. Toss again. And I'm just going to put them right here on the roasting tray. And then I'm going to move the tops into this mixing bowl. And we're going to put this in the fridge and save it for later for our little salad. So I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, our next project is the eggplant. So I know that there are some vegetarians out there. And so we're going to. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, what do we do with the potatoes? Do we pluck them or keep it? Oh, uh, cut them in half and then put them in water with salt. And then we're going to boil them on high heat. So that's kind of like one of the more time consuming. Uh, one of the more time consuming projects. So that's why we're doing it first. Yeah, just put them on high and we're just going to try to get those to cook. So by the time our steak's ready, the uh, potatoes are ready. I just sliced the radish. Yeah. yeah. And this is what, can people see that? That's kind of what they're going to look like. And we save the radish tops. The greens on top are going to be like a, um, a little salad later on. So let's talk about the eggplant. So I cut the eggplant in half. And with eggplant, when we roast it, we want to score it. So I'm just going to put little lines down the middle of the eggplant so that it doesn't get hard on top. When you score it like this, it kind of spreads out and gives it uh, a little room to breathe. So. That's a scored eggplant. And we're going to treat that really the same way as a radishes. Just a little bit of oil and salt and pepper. And then we're going to put that in the oven at 350. So we're going to get these roasted. And uh, we might have to pull them a little earlier, but we're, we're doing this all together. So we're going to get these roasting. And uh, then we'll move on to the chimichurri. So here come vegetables. This should probably take about 25 or 30 minutes. All right. No, I don't think so. <laughs> so next step, we're going to start the chimichurri. And so uh, anybody who got the bag or bought, you know, their stuff beforehand, I called for two Serrano chiles. Oh yeah, sorry. Two Serrano chiles. And um, if you don't like really spicy food, I would suggest using one, but I like spicy food. So I'm gonna put two Serranos in this uh, chimichurri. So I just kind of cut the tops off. Yeah, of course. Olive oil or vegetable oil for the veggies? So what we're using um, is a blend of olive oil and vegetable oil. For roasting like that, really either or. Yeah. When we fry the carrots later, that's and sear off the steak. That's why we have the blend. Because if it was 100% olive oil, it would it would smoke much quicker, and you wouldn't get a good sear on the stuff on the steak. And so I'm just cutting these serranos in half like this. So I took the two serranos cut them. I'm going to leave the seeds in. If you don't want seeds, uh, you can just kind of clear them out with the tip of your knife. Uh, I'm going to keep them though. So I cut them in half and then I'm going to cut these in half as well, just so you don't get huge bites of pepper in your chimichurri. And then I'm going to cut each one really small. Up. 
So we're kind of looking for that size. There's any chefs out on this thing watching? Don't don't judge me. We're home cooking right now. So, uh, um, and then we're gonna do the same with our cilantro and parsley. Um, I'm gonna take like a sprig of parsley and a couple of sprigs of cilantro, and actually set those to the side for our. Uh, I'm gonna put them right there. Those are gonna be for our mashed potatoes. Is there a question? Nope. She's okay, not, cool. She's directly oh, perfect, perfect. Awesome. And I think the feedback is if you could just even slow down. Slow it down. Time. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Because you're a pro. <laughs> That's what they say. I don't know. <laughs> Allegedly. Um, I will, <laughs> all right. So <laughs> these are the Serranos. It might take a while to chop them all. So in the meantime, uh, we'll just. Yeah, absolutely. So I started cooking. I started cooking pretty late in life, honestly. I uh, I was a professional musician, and uh, I basically spent, spent my whole twenties touring and playing in bands and playing gigs all over the United States. And when that fell through, I always had a love for food and I loved going out to eat, but I had no skills. So at like thirty, I walked into a restaurant and I was started as a dishwasher. I'm 36 now, so it's been a bit of a journey. I started in Florida and I moved to Arizona. So, yeah, that's kind of what, that's where I'm at. <laughs> We're lucky to have you here in Tucson. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I love Tucson. Oh, and Moody, actually, if we could give, like, Marshall's version of what's happened so far. Yeah, of course. Like, from the top. Of course. So we have started boiling our potatoes, which I cut in half. Uh, We're roasting the eggplant, which is scored. The eggplant and the radishes. Right there. And we are starting our chimichurri. So with a chimichurri, what we've done is taken two serranos or one if you're sensitive to heat uh, and chop them pretty finely, kind of small. And now we're about to chop the parsley and cilantro. And um, usually we, we do this in a food processor, but I like the texture of unprocessed food like that, you know, like, and especially to cook at home, I just put all the ingredients right in a bowl and add olive oil and vinegar. And it's just lovely like that. So, yeah. So with the, uh, with the parsley, what I did was made a bunch of it with my hand. So I kind of bunched it into a ball almost by turning it over on top of each other. I guess kind of how you would shift an odd basil if you shift an odd basil. <laughs> and I'm just gonna try to slice it very thinly. So we don't want huge chunks. And it gives it kind of a thin chopped herb. So I'll put that like that. And then with the stems, I love to use my stems in chimichurri. The stems actually have the most flavor. So uh, I just line them up and I'm gonna slice them really, really thinly. So there's that. And then we're gonna do the same with cilantro. So can pick through sometimes there's little you know funky ones down at the bottom so i'm just going to pick through these just a little and then... katina katina kohler is liking the tips that you have, so. oh great perfect awesome You're learning. and so i'm going to do the same with the cilantro just kind of bunch it up and slice it It's really important. It makes your life, it's, it's going to make your life a lot easier. You know, like uh, 
and, and and really it's the safest it's the safest way to go when you have a dull knife and you miss things and it slides around you can really hurt yourself so a sharp knife you know less tears with a sharp knife that's kind of the, the saying in kitchens are we using the stem of the cilantro yeah we are so the stem of the cilantro the stem of the parsley all the stems and then I'm going to use six cloves of garlic. Let's see if I can count on live TV. <laughs> Five, four, six. All right. And actually, I want to go check on these potatoes really quick. Not even close. So we'll keep those boiling. <laughs> so for the garlic, uh, I, we have garlic that's been already peeled. Um, but if not, just pull out a clove. Let people have a chance to peel their garlic. Yeah, we'll give them a second. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about the cornet? Yeah, so we the cornet has been uh, in Tucson for six years now, right? And um, we started, our original location was on 4th and 9th, right across from the shanty on 4th Street, right as you get out of the tunnel. And we were there for five years. Uh, it was started by Sally Kane and Gregor Kretschmann. Uh, and they've kind of been like the driving forces of the cornet for all that time. And the original chef was Erica Bostic, who was my chef when I first started the cornet. And, uh, and then she went on to other things and I became the chef. And then we were there for a couple of years. And then we moved to the spot in Barrio Viejo where Cushing Street Barn Grill used to be, which is just an amazing, amazing property. We uh, spent a summer kind of, you know, fixing it up, making it beautiful, and then opened in the fall and had a great five months until COVID hit and, you know, everything became, everything got topsy-turvy. What about La Armenita? So La Armenita was this, uh, our, this beautiful kind of breakfast and lunch spot, uh, which Erica Bostic was the chef of, who used to be the chef of the Cornet. And it's kind of this regional Mexican, like just extremely fresh, extremely simple, just a beautiful concept uh and and for breakfast and so they would work in the morning they'd be there at seven o'clock and they would leave at two and then we'd come in at like 11 and we'd work through the night into uh into service so we loved it i still love it hopefully we're gonna you know come back when this is all over uh it, it's been an interesting time but you know i feel like the whole world is learning a lot right now so i i wouldn't want it to be any different well, for those of, the, those of you that can hear me, um, we've gotten a lot of great feedback about the coronet, saying it's such a beautiful place. I'm so happy that I moved to Barrio Viejo. It's lovely. Yeah. It is wonderful. So, lots of great feedback. I some more water? Yeah, I'm adding a little bit more water. You, you want to check on your water just to make sure you don't reduce your water and your potatoes are going to burn in the pan. So, don't run out of water with your potatoes. I probably put a little a little less than I should have initially, but those are going right now. Okay. Okay. So I think, uh, I think our, garlic, our garlic's good. Okay. So here's a, a bulb of garlic. I just hold it on the flat part of a knife and smash it down like that. Can you see it? Yep. It's on there. All right, cool. So I smash it and then I slice down it kind of rough chop the garlic. I like to have big chunks of garlic and things. I mean, not huge, not a whole clove, but uh, for chimichurri especially, I think this is kind of the way to do it. So I'll slow, slow that down a little bit. Make sure you're safe. Pretty, be pretty safe when you do that. <laughs> this is, that's, that's not a job to do without, you know, like it needs 100% attention. <laughs> it won't take extra wine, right? Yeah. The, you know, it's funny. I just recommended that everyone grab a sip of wine. <laughs> we were doing some storytelling. So. Wine's fine, but, you know, no, like, you know, wait, wait hold off on the hard stuff, maybe. <laughs> All right, so that's the mix. Um, 
And what I'm going to do, I'm going to put all these things into a bowl. I'm going to use my hands because we're not all eating this. <laughs> so I'm just going to scrape all that in. And then I'm going to add oil. How much oil? <laughs> I'd add two cups of oil to this amount. I'd say around two cups. Really what you want to do is you just want to get it to cover it, which we have here. And I'm going to get a spoon. This is the amount of oil that we were given. I measured it out to start with. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then I just, I'm just going to kind of hand emulsify these herbs and garlic and serrano into this. Yeah, we had a question from someone earlier about six cups of oil. That's too much oil for my, to be able to cook it as a, like they thought we were going to be deep frying. <laughs> oh, well, we we're going to deep fry some carrots. So that's part of the reason there's so much. But not six cups worth. Right. Yeah, not just for the carrots, no. So now that the oil has kind of covered it, we're gonna add, I would say, <laughs> let me make a point really quick about this. <laughs> it's good to taste your food, right? So like you can rely on the recipe. I'm gonna get my little spoons here. <laughs> but one step, and really this is like flexing a good muscle when it comes to, home, especially as a home cook, you know, like you want to be able to taste things and, and, and tell what it needs and trust your instincts because you're cooking for yourself. You're not cooking for a recipe and you're not cooking for other people and you want to cook what you like. So it's good to always continually taste as you cook. So what I'm going to do here, I think I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it two tablespoons, two tablespoons, two tablespoons yeah. of red wine vinegar. So there's about two tablespoons and then salt and pepper. And then I'm going to taste it. So I'm going to mix it together again, like kind of like hand emulsifying. And then I'm going to taste it for what I like since I'm cooking for us. How about you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Is that an option? What do you recommend? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you just, um, you can absolutely cook it on the grill. I mean, this is kind of would be like a nice chimichurri and grilled steak is like a perfect, a perfect blend. So this is kind of how I like it. Uh, it's not, it's not like a, a, a very uh, processed chimichurri it's really rough and there's big pieces in there and that's exactly how i like it especially for making steak in the summertime it smells really good from here awesome awesome and my eyes are watering a little with the, with the so i'm just going to put this in the fridge and let it kind of chill and come together in the refrigerator so we can put that there and then we're going to check on our potatoes because that's the thing giving me all the anxiety in the world not really but <laughs> There's a lot more things to be anxious about. <laughs> Can you see the potatoes? Yeah, let's yeah. So, you know, cooking potatoes, you just want them to be fork tender. These are still, these are still working. <laughs> and then we'll take a look at our roast vegetables down here. The radishes are kind of coming along. You can tell when the white part of the radish kind of picks up the color of the skin that it's beginning to roast. Um, when these purple ones are done, you'll kind of have a purplish hue in there and a pinkish hue on the red ones. And uh, that eggplant is not even close to being done. So we're going to keep those roasting along. Is that, right, is, that, is that where you normally would put it on the top one? I'm just curious. Uh, I will put it on the middle one, but there's kind of, see, on this, in this oven, there's like a bottom and a top. Do you want, it, do you want us to switch that? No, no, I think, okay. it's, I think that's fine. That's All kind right. of a minor, minor thing. All right. So, I'm going to clean this up a little bit here. Any questions? Um, uh, pepper on the chimichurri? Yeah, I put a little bit of pepper on the, yeah. Okay. 
Salt, salt, definitely. Pepper. And a good amount of salt, yeah. But like I said, taste, taste, taste. I always flex that tasting. That's a muscle you want to flex. Not your recipe reading muscle as much as your tasting muscle. Because you won't always have a recipe and sometimes you'll just have a bunch of random stuff. And if you really want to learn to, to cook, I would say my point would be to, t to flex the tasting muscle. <laughs> so what other, like, you think are your most important things as you're cooking? Do you have any, like go-to things that you always follow in terms of recommending to other people when they're cooking or learning to cook? Yeah, so learning to cook. So I would... <laughs> So it's funny because I'm going to contradict myself all over the place on the, these answers. Um, I think that, um, you know, you, you, you should always cook, you know, like you should always try to cook what you like. And I think that a lot of people are trying to, to cook in a certain style or push a certain vibe or whatever, and it doesn't come naturally to them. And I think that the best way to cook is to cook what comes naturally and to cook what you love cooking, cook what you want to eat. You know, that's for me, number one. It's great to learn other things and to cook, you know, different food and whatever. But I think the first step to really learning the basics of cooking is to learn them by cooking what you already know that you love to eat. So that's, I don't know. That's some advice <laughs> for, what, for what it's worth. All right, so we're gonna do these carrots now. And so Jasper here, hold on one second. I'm gonna give this little. Once our potatoes are cooked through, do we drain them? Uh, yes, we will. Are there potatoes cooked through? That was fast. Awesome. Every stove top is different, right? <laughs> yeah. Ours are almost there. Um, let's see. We will drain them, yes. Um, and then we're gonna make we're gonna make the mashed potatoes inside of this pot right here. So keep the pot. That's so, Steph, when we ask yeah. you a question, uh -huh. you're going to need to repeat it back. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, these are almost done. Great. So, we'll get the carrots, and then we'll start on the potatoes. All right. So, now we are going to work on the carrots. I'm going to take the two biggest carrots and peel them, and those are going to be for our fried carrots. Thank you. <laughs> so you want to get the skin off first. Yeah, these are really nice. Take five points, yeah. And there's a good amount of them. So we're actually, the people that bought their stuff at five points are going to have a little bit of extra carrots. And we're going to make a carrot and radish top salad to go with this dish. It wasn't... Okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to repeat the questions when you guys ask me. And then you might need to remind me to do that too. Because it doesn't come naturally. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. And so what I'm doing is now, once we're into the carrot and the skin is gone, we're just going to peel right through the carrot. And um, a great a, a way to do this is to kind of rotate the carrot. So you're always kind of peeling one of the edges that gives you one of these nice thin ribbons. So if you can try to rotate the carrot as you peel. That gives you a nice I'll put these here, dropping them all over the place. So everybody's good, keeping up. Good. All right, great. Rotating their carrot, carrot. So you can see them actually rotating carrots. <laughs> no. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> what a what a world we are in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great. Well, that's just a little. Oh, great. So I say, rotate as you peel. 
<laughs> okay, perfect. Rotate as you feel. Great. So this is going to be my last carrot. And then we're going to save these for a salad. Actually, Chef Moody, yeah, question. of course. And I got to repeat why, it. Why do most chefs say to peel carrots before using? Is the skin better or just aesthetic? Uh, why so, the yeah. So why, why would a chef peel the carrot before using it? That is a good question. <laughs> I can tell you exactly why some people do and some people don't. Like the reason I'm peeling this carrot is because the skin is not gonna fry at the same speed as the inside meat of the carrot. It's much more tender and the skin is tougher. So that's why I peel this. But when, for the salad, I'm not gonna peel it. I actually prefer unpeeled carrots for certain, in, in, cer in certain applications. It's really an aesthetic thing. I think some people would say that if you put carrot skin in like a stock or something, it could make it cloudier and more bitter. And there's definitely truth to that as well. If you're doing like classic French cooking. For me, I like carrots with skin on it. I think it gives it a great texture. I think it gives it a rustic look. I, I enjoy that. So Get a little bit of carrot. yeah, I mean, there's, you know, it will cloud up a stock if you're trying to make a super clear stock or consomme or something like that. But um, at the Cornet, when we roast carrots, generally we roast carrots with the skin on. So that's just, that's one of my things. And I'm a fan of like the rustic style. So, but you know, to each his own. So here's our carrots that we will be frying eventually. And these are our carrots for the salad. Okay. Yeah. I think that was a good clarifying question because someone just asked, are the large carrots fried whole and the ribbons for the salad? No, the, the ribbons are what's going to be fried. Okay. The ribbons are going to be fried and then the whole carrots, we're going to just slice down. We're going to wash them and slice them down. And that's going to be in the salad. Yeah. So the, the whole carrots, we're going to kind of save a few of them for the salad, which is going to be the radish top salad, which we're just throwing on last minute because we have all this beautiful produce. Uh, but the ribbons, we are going to fry them in oil. So they're going to be crispy carrot ribbons for the dish. And by now, I think our potatoes are ready. So if everybody wants to prepare with a towel to get their potatoes out. If you want to strain it in a colander, that's cool. Or you can just strain it into the, into the sink if your potatoes are ready. So first, everybody should check just to make sure because nobody likes raw potatoes. And yeah, these are fork tender on my side. So if you have fork tender potatoes, let's dump the water right now. <laughs> I don't have a colander, so. You don't need all the fancy tools. You really don't. <laughs> you really don't. What don't we need? Fancy tools. You don't need all the fancy tools. That's a big conspiracy. You can make beautiful food just at home. All right, so for the potatoes, these are Roman mashed potatoes. Uh, Roman as in Rome, Italy, and instead of butter and salt and cream and that route, the salt comes from anchovies and the fat is olive oil. So we have our oil and our anchovies. And then I kept some herbs from the chimney, just a, f a little bit that we're going to throw in there. So, and, and if people's potatoes are not ready yet, what do you recommend? Uh, if your potatoes aren't ready yet, I would recommend keeping them on until they're ready. And then uh, if you have any questions, we'll back up and like yeah. talk to anybody whose potatoes weren't ready. We'll talk you through it again. So I'm just going to hand tear herbs and throw them on top of the potatoes. You can see that. Really rough, lots of stems. And then I'm going to add oil. Some olive oil to it. And then anchovies. Um, these are gonna be more anchovies than we need. Uh, I guess these are the, sm the smallest amount that we could find. So I'm just gonna drain these into a, they've got a lot of oil in them. So I'm gonna drain them into a bowl. And I'd say, hmm, let's see. I'm just gonna put my finger in there, why not? 
<laughs> You're not preparing him for the masses. Yeah, this is just for us, so it's hard to get him out of there. I have, I mean, yeah, if you have a little baby fork or I think I have a pair of tweezers, which actually come in very handy in this situation. So if you have tweezers or anything like that, you can grab them out. Tweezers did the trick. <laughs> Not many people have tweezers in their kitchen, but yes. <laughs> so this is a lot, a lot of anchovies for what we're using. So anchovies can also be used in uh, salad dressings, soups, anything. I mean, this is just a great umami flavor. And um, so, I mean. Also question, yeah. let's say someone made their chimichurri and used all the herbs. Could one take a little bit of the chimichurri? And put the absolutely, it's the same stuff. Like yeah, absolutely. So the question was, if you use all the, your herbs on your chimichurri, you can absolutely take the chimichurri and put it into the potatoes uh, if you're wanting to do that. It's really the same ingredients, garlic and the herbs. So I put three fillets of anchovies into these potatoes. And then I think a little bit more oil. And if you have a potato masher, that will help you a lot. Or as we're gonna do it here, we're gonna do it, I'm gonna do it with, with a fork. So I'm just gonna break up the potatoes in the olive oil with a fork and get the anchovies mixed in and kind of. And you use just three little anchovies? Three little... Yeah, three anchovy fillets. And this, this dish can take a lot of oil, so don't be shy about that. It is the fat that kind of makes them mashed potatoes. So whereas like, you know, the European or the, you know, the Northern European style of butter and cream, the Italians used fish and olive oil. So when we got that hand mashed to that consistency, I like it sort of chunky like that. Uh, you don't want to add salt because anchovies have tons of salt. Um, the anchovies really act as the salt in this dish. So we'll put that there. And then if you grab your microplane and a bulb of garlic. What do they do if they don't have a microplane? If you don't have a microplane, you can just do the smash and slice that we did for the chimichurri. And then I'm just gonna microplane, whoops, microplane the garlic into the potatoes. I'm gonna do two bulbs of garlic. Yeah, that's the anchovies really give it a a nice someone someone commented and said an acquired taste. <laughs> it's a good way to acquire them because everything's good with potatoes. Potatoes are, you know, the perfect. So I'm just mixing that together. And so another important thing to do for all of us is to taste. So it could be that you find yours are not salty enough and you maybe want to add more anchovies or not garlicky enough. Or... I think this is great. The three fillets worked wonderfully for me, but if you want more salt, add it. If you want more garlic, you can add that too. So that's, that's what it looks like at this point. Great. Awesome. Uh, while we have a little break, yeah. is there any wines you'd recommend to the students? Um, what wines? Yeah, what wines would I recommend with this meal? Uh, I, I, Syrah, I, I think would be really wonderful in Malbec, like something with body, maybe a, like a, a, a more of a smoky wine. Sally, what wines would you recommend? A Malbec, yeah, there we go. Yeah. We have a wine back here from Five Points if you would like to share this. 
Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. This is uh this is from the natural wine company, yeah, right? So this is this is a natural wine. I don't know if it's biodynamic, but it's a Mexican wine. And it's a beautiful red that they carry at uh five points. And it's a natural wine, which are like some of my favorites. Uh natural wines are amazing and kind of like shaking up the wine industry right now, which is fun. So there, there's a lot of different levels to it. I know like a lot of them are biodynamic in which they don't like, you know, a lot of these wine companies don't allow like cell phones, electricity. I mean, they do it completely like the old fashioned way, you know, so it's organic, biodynamic. Um, there's like some mystical elements and, and, and theories sometimes I like the with them. Yeah. So um, yeah, that kind of, Oh, biodynamic. Let me think about exactly what that means. What does biodynamic mean? I think, <laughs> I think it ha so it has to be organic. And then um, I'm trying to remember all the times the guy from Natural Wine Company is explaining me exactly what biodynamic was. It's organic and it's not processed. And there's, no, I don't think there's like, a lot of times there's not electricity used and it's kind of uh, completely old school natural. yeah exactly but there is there there are actual like parameters for what biodynamic means but i would be lying if i try to make them up right now i kind of know but i'm not an expert yeah all right so we've got our potatoes let's check on our roasting vegetables Still, still need some time. Oh, well, your radishes to be, you know, pretty much fork tender as well, too. So, all right. <laughs> all right, so let's fry our carrots. So if you want to get a burner on high. We need to throw the fire yeah, that would I'm sure that would be great. How do you do that? Oh, perfect. <laughs> That's awesome. So you want to get a good amount of oil in, I would say about a cup and a half. Okay. And you're going to turn that on high and you're going to wait until that oil is hot and then we're going to deep fry these carrots. This is kind of like the more complicated thing that we're doing today. So if anybody has questions, please ask. Yeah, this is a, it's not complicated. It's actually really easy deep frying, but it's, it's, you know, it can be tricky on a home stove. So what I have over here in my station is I have a, a plate with paper towels. That's where the carrots are going to go once they're fried. I've got my carrots, the ribbons, ready to go. So I'll leave them right here. And I have salt for when they come out of the fry. So when, I'm, when you're frying at home, really, you want to get the... the, the you want to get the oil hot enough to where when you drop the carrot in, you hear the sizzle, you know, the frying sizzle, right? We all know that sound. And then when they're done frying, they stop singing. They stop making that sizzling sound. So we'll just do it together. But like right now the oil isn't hot enough. It's not sizzling at all. So basically we're going to wait for a second. Kind of in the meantime, while we wait for that to heat up, I feel like uh, every, with everything going on right now in the world, I wanted to plug a book that I'm reading and I'm just absolutely uh, enthralled by. It's by uh, a gentleman named Michael Twitty. He's a scholar of Southern food and West African food. And this book is called The Cooking Gene. It won the James Beard Award 
for um well we all know james beard it won the J- james beard award um and it's basically like a journey through african american culinary history in the old south so it's the story of people who are in bondage coming to the deep south and creating the american food culture and a, a lot of it is what we're still doing today uh and it came from those people so with everything going on i just wanted to plug this book and it, it, michael twitty if you follow him on instagram or facebook uh he's got so much great information so uh just wanted to say that really quickly yeah um, people are really grateful for that share. oh cool yeah. How deep should the oil be in case their pans are the same size? So you said about a cup and a half of oil. About a cup and a half, but yes, the pans are like half an inch. Half an inch. Yeah. And so, let's see. It's not sizzling yet. I'm literally just taking a piece, putting it in there to see if it sizzles. So we're going to wait just a second. All right. Do you have favorite Southern food? Yeah, I do. I grew up in Kentucky. So uh, I, I, I would say like Kentucky food is really, really close to my heart. Like just high quality pimento cheese, smoked hams. I love mutton. I, in Kentucky, we're really famous for our mutton barbecue. So it's like old lamb barbecue. <laughs> it's not brisket. It's not anything like that. It's a real classic Kentucky dish so like mutton barbecue there's a stew called burgoo which is uh, uh, a mutton stew which is really popular in Kentucky but yeah all across the south I mean I think I southern food is really near and dear to my heart so uh, I spent a lot of time in Kentucky a lot of time in Florida so uh, southern seafood fried oyster sandwiches I just think that you know the produce and the, and the, the the quality of the quality of the product you can get in the South is really the, almost unrivaled in the United States. So I mean, products are great everywhere, but it just I hold it close to my heart. Yeah. All right. So let's see about. Okay, the sizzling. You want to bring the camera closer, and we can. Is there a light here? So we have a light. There's the sizzle. Can you can you see that? I can hear it. Okay, cool. Can people see it? You yeah, see it? People can see it. All right, cool. People can see the all right, so I'm gonna drop these in here, all right? And we're gonna let them sizzle away. And uh, get your tongue. People can see it. So. They can see that. They're good. Awesome. How long are you gonna let them sizzle for you? So, when you're frying. You never know. It's kind of the amount of moisture. What happens when you fry is that the oil pulls the moisture out of it. That's why things get crispy. So uh, when you put them in, they make that sound. And then eventually that will slow down. And when it stops cooking turns, they call it when it stops singing okay. is when you pull it and you know it's going to be crispy. Yeah, that's really the, sh- the answer for that. Uh, it shouldn't be too long here. And another really nice thing that's going to happen is when you're done with these carrots and you pull them out and they're crispy, uh, the oil is going to be infused with these really beautiful carrots from Five Points. So you can use that oil later on to make salad dressings, to uh, sear other meats. Like if I had ch- if I had carrot infused oil, I would love to sear chicken in that oil. Like carrots and chickens love each other, you know, classically. So these are going. Is everybody having good luck with us? Everyone's happy so far. Um, where are these oh, that's amazing. Are really yeah, yeah. It's a nice time to come down here and check on these. 
So. Good. <laughs> good. Good. Wonderful. So if I'm, I'm gonna, I'm this at three fifty is taking a little bit to roast my vegetables. So if you look at your radishes, and they seem like they're not even close to being done, I would join me and kick this up to four hundred and fifty. Okay. If they're not getting done, I mean every oven is different. Our oven at work, they would have been. Yeah, if if it's not if they're not you know, if they seem extremely hard with a fork, so these are getting there. What are you looking for? Jeff? So we're looking for basically like can you see here where they've stopped and they're starting to get dark and you don't see that oil bubbling? See, this is done right here, right? So you're gonna take your tongs and make sure to drain as much oil as you can off it and then onto the plate. And then once they get on the plate, salt. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull them. I think you guys will have good luck with that as well. So you pull them and you salt them and make sure to drain that oil off as much as possible. I mean, you're never gonna get all the oil off, but the more oil you get drained off, the quicker it'll crisp up as soon as it's out. So everybody having good luck with that? Yeah, All right, great. Perfect. All right. So there are fried carrots. And uh, the oil that we've deep fried in, I would uh, just leave that back here until it's cold, cooled off. And then you can either put it in a container or put it in the garbage, but I wouldn't pour it down your sink. Just, you know, <laughs> all right. So, yeah, there we go. That's perfect. So we'll keep, kind of just keeping the potatoes on the stove in warm areas to keep the heat. They'll hold their heat for a while. And now we're gonna go ahead and sear the steak. So let me wipe this down a little bit, put my stuff. So this is a culotte steak or a sirloin cap. Um, it's one of my favorite steaks. We serve it at the restaurant. It's got this beautiful fat cap. Um, some people look at it and say, oh my God, there's so much fat, but we're gonna render all that fat and it's gonna, we're gonna cook the steak in it. So we'll do that all together. So what we did was took it out of its packaging and then we're gonna give it a good amount of salt and pepper. When a steak hits a pan, it loses about, I'd say 40 to 50% of its seasoning. So that's when you see people liberally seasoning steaks. I mean, there's a reason for that. It's not just to be like, Pew! salt, it's amazing, you know? we lose a lot once it hits the oil. So uh, I'm gonna kind of just set that there, let the salt in there, and then I'm gonna sear. I'm gonna put a little bit of oil in this pan to start searing. So I would do just enough to cover the bottom of your pan, just enough to cover your, the bottom of your pan, a little bit, cover the bottom and then maybe one more glug so that you can kind of move it across like that. If anybody has any more questions, I mean, I know that's not a scientific. Oh, I, I got you word for word for it, so. <laughs> It's not a scientific I way to, yeah. okay, perfect, <laughs> great. So we're gonna let our steak sit for a second and then uh, we're gonna see it. You have my husband's undivided attention, Seth Rudy. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Katina. That's awesome. Okay, yeah. Perfect. So uh, first for everybody who's sauteing it or searing it in a pan, I would put this on high. You're gonna wait until that pan is smoking, literally smoke coming off of it. Uh, the oil that, it's all the same oil. So, 
It's a, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, sorry, that's, <laughs> yeah, it's the, uh, the blend. Yeah, yeah, you wanna see smoke coming off it. And uh, if you're gonna grill, uh, I would get your grill really hot and then I would brush that steak with oil and then season it the same exact way so it doesn't, the skin doesn't rip off it. And then I would grill it. If you have a meat thermometer, I'd grill it to about 120. I mean, yeah, just put it on the grill and make sure the, make sure the grill is really hot so you get nice grill marks and close the top and leave it alone. <laughs> that's, that's what I would say, yeah. Just get grill marks on one side and then flip it. I'd say the whole thing might take on a grill, depend, depending on how hot the grill is, like 10 minutes. And how thick the steak? How, yeah, we should all have the same steak. Well, if they bought their own steak. But if they bought their own steak, 10 ounce steak, I would say. Yeah. We're happy with the meat thermometer of 120. So yeah, 120, yeah. right in the center, I would stick it right like into this part so that the meat thermometer goes all the way in right into the middle. Right. Yeah. All right. So I can hear little, uh, there's little pieces of water or little droplets of water in the oil and you can hear that, you know, that's what makes the oil explode is when little pieces of little droplets are in there. So once you hear those popping, you know that your pan's getting nice and hot. As we're waiting on that, we might as well cut our carrots for the salad. So I'm just gonna. You know, actually, I think that kind of multitasking might be risky in this situation. <laughs> we're just gonna do one thing at a time. Okay, so now I can see there's a little bit of smoke coming off. Sometimes, I mean, I, I look at it like this and I can see that there's smoke. So uh, we're gonna start this here. So it's important to lay your steak down away from you, not into you, because it'll bring a wave of oil at you and nobody wants that. So I've got it uh, seasoned on one side. I'm gonna lay it down to sear and then I'm gonna season the side that isn't seasoned afterwards. So here we go. Everybody can see that good? Yeah. Nice. Okay, perfect. Then I'm gonna sear, or then I'm gonna season the other side. Nice. So for searing in a pan and, and steaks in general, it's great to just leave them alone. We wanna get a nice hard crust on that on the steak and fiddling with it like a lot of people want to do all this stuff and really the best thing to do is just leave it okay for someone who is using what they have at home they yeah have a dirt steak. uh huh how how um, so, how many approximately their thin slice? yeah the skirt steaks are really thin so you might what we're going to do is we're going to sear both sides and roast it the skirt steak, you can probably just sear with us and it'll be good okay. on the inside. So we can look at the sear. It's getting there. I'm gonna give it a little bit more time. Katie says, I love crust. Perfect, awesome. Yeah, that's what we're going for. We're going for a nice, crust on the outside. Let me give it a little bit more time still. Yeah, well this, there seemed to be a kind of a cool spot there. So I'm gonna get that yeah. dark. Yeah. Okay,
Okay, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna go and flip it right now. Flipping it away. Yeah. So there we are. And you can see there is like the kind of crust from the sear. And then we're gonna do that other side for about the same amount of time. Awesome. Oh, the crew says it smells good. And I think it smells pretty good too. Yeah, it's nice. Did anybody say uh, it smells absolutely horrific right now? <laughs> I would be, oh, that would be horrific. Oh, thank you. All right, so now that we've got a crust on the bottom too, this is kind of uh, an important thing on a culotte steak is that there's that fat cap that we were talking about earlier. You want to take your tongs and you want to render the fat out of it. Two and a half minutes, I'd say two, two minutes, two minutes per side. Depending on the heat of your oven, really what you're looking for is a crust like that. More than time, you want to look for that dark crust. But two, two and a half minutes is, yeah. You can see that some of the fat is coming out of that fat cap. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna finish this in the oven. The internal temperature is still pretty low. So we wanna bring it up to 120 inside the oven. If you don't have a thermometer, which I'm not using a thermometer either, you wanna get it to about the bottom of your thumb in, in, in uh, firmness. But if we do it all together at the same time, there might be variations, but the steak's gonna be cooked and very nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this underneath into the oven. Now, if you were just roasting that steak, if you're just roasting that steak, uh, it would take a lot longer, but because that pan is so hot on the bottom and both sides have already been seared, it's probably gonna be ready in about four minutes. All right, and we put that at 400. At 400 now, yeah. Did I turn that off? Why would I do that? When did I turn that off? I didn't pay any attention that you were doing that. <laughs> yeah, 400. Whatever you're roasting the veggies on. And then we'll go. So I'm going to move everything out of the way, and I guess we're going to try to start plating this. Is it? Are we? Perfect. Everybody doing okay? Yeah, I think so. Uh, what about the other carrots that are waiting for us? Oh, we're going to make a salad with those. I'm gonna give this one more minute. Well, you know what? I think it's time to pull the steak. It's good. Yeah. So with the steak, I just put it on a plate and we're gonna let it rest to kind of reincorporate all of the juices. So um, if you were to cut it right now, all the juices would flow out of it and it would be unfortunate. So it's really nice to rest meat. Yeah. In the meantime, 
we can cut the carrots. So who is ever asking about the rest of the carrots? We've got our radish tops. I'm going to kind of pick through a Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, if you're running low on oil, that carrot oil is perfect for it. Oh, thank you. Jeez, I'm sorry. All right. So we have these radish tops. And this wasn't planned, but we just had all this extra nice stuff, and it's great to use. You know, waste not, want not, as they say. So I just rinse the carrots and I'm gonna slice them. These are really nice, local, beautiful carrots. Yeah, totally. And on this one, I did not peel the carrots because. Yeah, of course. There you are. You're very welcome. <laughs> so, a nice carrot and radish green salad. And I'm just going to use the um, red wine vinegar, a few squirts. Salt and pepper and oil. And that gets us where we want to be on that salad. So for the vegetarians, the eggplant is like nice and creamy on the inside, which is exactly what you wanted. Almost like baba ganoush encased in the outer, outer shell. It's yeah, it's creamy on the inside. And um, the radishes, these are done nicely. Uh, think, well, a good way to, if you, if you can cut through them, you know, A, you can taste them. And they're really nice like that. I would say if they're blistered, slightly shriveled, have some brown on them, they're done. So I set a little thing over here. And the radishes are great. So we're gonna set up our main course or we're gonna make, put our dinner together. <laughs> so, we'll get everything. Huh? Oh, your was. <laughs> it's right here. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, we're getting the chimichurri out of the fridge. Just wanna have all of our components together. These radishes are really beautiful. All right. So we can plate up. First step, our mashed potatoes. However you like, I'm just gonna put them right down the center. Steak. Now it's rested, I'm gonna slice the steak. And that's a nice 
medium rare. And with a steak, I just cut it right down the center. I enjoy this particular cut, sliced. You know, I like New York strips whole. Just kind of depends on how you like it, but for the summertime, for some reason, and this, this, this cut, I love like this. So there's that. And we'll give it a bunch of radishes. And usually I would wear gloves, but we're just cooking for ourselves. So I'm going to take, take my liberties today. So we got radishes. You guys have been really diligent about how stuff's Oh my God. Yes, absolutely. That's why I'm thinking about it every time I feel like, oh, oh, but you know, cooking for myself. But yes, that's very important. I'm gonna run the chimichurri right down the center. And you know, if you get a, if any of the olive oil goes into the potatoes, it's gonna be even better. So I just kinda, <laughs> and the radishes, it's really lovely like that. And then for a garnish, crispy carrots and there's the dish I'll put a plate up a little salad right on the side just to kind of so everybody knows the radish top and carrot salad Hey, hey, so does anybody have questions? Or are they, is everybody kind of on the same page or do we have any? People are just saying it looks incredible. Awesome. Ho hopefully everybody's does at home too. I'm just gonna put the rest of these carrots on there. I can't believe we've raised what? How much, almost 4,000? Over $3,000. Three, over $3,000, that's. Let folks know that I'm gonna share the GoFundMe link in here. Okay. Okay, so lots of people are going to share the GoFundMe link for the fundraiser again in the Zoom chat, right? Is that how to say that? Yeah. All right, great. You can tell everybody we're also going to send the recording out if they want to. Oh, perfect. And we'll send the recording out if you want to do it again or send it to anybody or that. I wish it would just go away. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This was great. This was great fun. Thank you because this was super amazing. It was a blast. Um, so big shout out to the cornet. Do you want to say? Oh yeah, yeah. So obviously, big shout out to the cornet. Five points, Five points and La Suprema, yeah. and Lalo Guerrera. I mean, this is what we're doing this for. Yeah. You know, we're not. Uh, everyone said great job. Thank you. Effort. And I just wanted to say, like, you know, while we're here making this beautiful food, it's also you know, super important to remember everything that's going on in the world right now and be in solidarity with all that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Oh, I don't know. I think they'll be able to hear you. And this is really yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know if people can hear. I'll have to get close to you, Rudy. We're breaking our, our social distance. Oh. <laughs> but um, thank you, everyone, who has joined. Uh, this has been super fun. And again, I posted the link for those of you who maybe you want to still contribute or contribute even more to the Lalo Guerrero fund. Um, I posted it and the more the merrier at this point, but we've reached our goal and we just really wanted to say thank you for that. We are super excited to be able to serve our neighbors and our community um, and really to bring together so many, um, so many voices and, and businesses in Barrio Viejo. It's super special to us and we're just glad to, to get to foster more of that community here. So thank you. Thank and you. Also, this looks amazing.
amazing. It smells amazing. If anyone is on Facebook, which I know a lot of you must be, take a photo, post it, tag La Suprema, the Coronet, five points. That'd be really fun to see everybody's dish. We're yeah, that would that'd make me really happy. Yeah. <laughs> also, thank you to Chef Moody. You made this super digestible, like a super simple way to make really delicious food. You explained it in such a great way. So Awesome. That's the only way to make it, simple, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Awesome. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Sally, did you see it? Awesome. I can't believe I turned the oven off in the middle of all that. Slick move. It's going to be awesome. awesome. And tell them that there's always uses for the extra chimichurri. Oh my God, that's phenomenal. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Someone said you have to send the recipe ahead of time. <laughs> the notes to follow along. I'll have to do that. Next time. Didn't we?